Okay, so this is the last week you will have to uh, put up with me, but um, we are excited to continue our series in Acts. And so we heard from Peter giving us an introduction. Um, I've been with you the last two or three weeks, and I was talking to, uh, to Durrett earlier, and said, I always enjoy a series. When you hear from the same passage, uh, from the same person, in particular, I think of Bob Hayes, comes every October. Um, but then I said, I'm not used to doing series, and it is a lot of time to put in, and I enjoy what, what, what I've learned from these passages, and so it's my desire to convey just some of that. And I know um, I have a tendency to kind of race through and try to cover more than I can handle in 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Um, uh, but we're going to narrow down here and be a little more focused than we have been. Um, <clears throat> Jody, you mind getting my water? Sorry. So these three weeks, I've kind of summed it up uh, with lessons we can learn from the early church. And one thing I kind of mentioned the last few weeks is what lessons can we learn from the early church? But before we ask that question, we need to ask ourselves, do we want to learn from the early church? Because if we don't want to learn from the early church, if we don't want to learn lessons from the book of Acts, then we're going to have a hard time uh, finding those lessons that we can take from this great book that tells us how the church was formed, how it was established, how it grew early on. And then we have to ask ourselves the question, do we want to be a part of this word and church increasing, multiplying, prevailing, being strengthened, being built up. I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of that. I want Fifth Avenue Chapel to be a part of that, to be a, a part of what the early church was doing. And we've been reminded the last few weeks we have the same God. We have the same risen Savior. We have the same Holy Spirit that the early uh, apostles and followers of Christ were indwelt with. And so we can't forget the power and the opportunity that we have here as a chapel and as individuals part of this chapel family. So just a quick summary of Acts 3 to 4. I know we won't be able to cover it, but just so you know what we're looking at here. We have, um, this the, the passage we're going to look at this morning is the lame beggar being healed. And the reason I thought this might be beneficial to focus our time on this is this starts a chain of events that we see in the rest of Acts chapter 3 and through Acts chapter 4. Because the lame beggar was healed by Peter and John, by the Holy Spirit through Peter and John, we see Peter having the opportunity to preach in Solomon's portico. Uh, we see Peter and John arrested and held in custody overnight. Uh, we see Peter and John before the council. And then we also see following their um, admonition uh, from uh, the council, they go to be with believers and they're encouraged and they pray for boldness. That's a great passage. And I'm sorry, we don't have the time to cover that. But that's a really great passage and a reminder for us that we need to be with other believers, encourage one another, and pray together, pray for boldness. And then we're reminded again, just like we were at the end of Acts chapter 2, the end of Acts chapter 4 tells us there was not a needy person among them. They were sharing in the needs. And I have this picture here. You might not recognize this person unless you have kids. Craig and Danielle, do you know who that is? Okay. The newest Disney movie is Encanto, and there's an Uncle Bruno. And, and so I ask, what's in a name? And so in this movie, Uncle Bruno is bad luck. He's just someone. And so uh, one of the children says his name and says, oh, no, we don't talk about Bruno. And there's a very catchy song, and the kids love hearing it every day. And, and, and it says, we don't talk about Bruno. So uh, this whole idea, the reason I thought of that is because you go to Acts chapter 4, and basically that's what the council says about the name of Jesus. They say, Peter and John, you cannot preach or teach in the name of Jesus. They had a real time. And I... Just don't say that name. Just don't say the name of Jesus. Um, and then we see in this story that we're going to read today, the lame beggar is healed in the name of Jesus. And in the name, we could say by the power of Jesus and by the will of Jesus, others would say. So we're going to look at this Acts chapter 3. Um, so let's read that first before we move on. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 11, let's read to. And as you turn there, we will have time to talk about opposition to the gospel. Craig's going to get us into that next week as he looks at Acts chapter 5. Through the book of Acts, we will see opposition to the gospel. So I don't want to, um, I, I'm not skipping that on purpose. We see that through Acts chapter 4, um, but that's something that we want to learn. Well, how did the church respond to that? How should we respond to opposition to the gospel? But today we're going to start with this uh, event that led to the chain of events following it. So Acts chapter 3, let's read one through 11, and I'm reading from ESV. 
Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Verse 11 says, while he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astonished, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. This is a great story, one that I, I'm sure many of us, if not all of us, have heard. And as we jump into it, I want to look at Peter and John as partners in the gospel. I have a picture here, maybe not the most flattering picture. Lisa saw this yesterday, and she's like, why are you showing that? But this is one of our favorite hikes, one of my favorite hikes, um, called the Kalalau Trail, um, a very treacherous hike. And I was thankful. I know Lisa was thankful to have me to hike with. Um, she would sometimes start to fall and grab me and start to pull me down with her. I said, no, hold on a second. Like, one of us has to be standing. Um, so I shook her off and let her fall. No, I didn't do that. But there's, a, there's a, a part of this hike called Crawler's Ledge. And I remember, and I think I've shared this with Lisa, I'm not sure, but she was holding on to me. But I remember at that point, I was glad to have someone to hold on to because the rocks were slipping. It was very, it was a ledge, probably this narrow, and you're leaning against the rocks so you don't fall. And I was thankful to have a partner in that hike. Well, Peter and John were partners in the gospel. We know that they were great competitors. If you look at the gospel of John, I think uh, chapter 20, well, we know that John was considered one of the sons of thunder, and we know Peter's personality, right? We read about him and him being the first to speak often. Um, but we also read the Gospel of John, I think it's chapter 20, where John uh, just includes in his gospel that he outran Peter. And so why would he include that? I don't think there's any theological deep message for us. I think he's just trying to let people know, hey, I'm a little faster than Peter. I don't, but they were great competitors. They had those bold personalities. But we also know they were great partners in the gospel. Um, Peter maybe could have done this all by himself, I, and I say that, I, I want to be careful when I say that. We have no record of John speaking in Acts chapters 3 and 4, but he's often mentioned. You read through this passage, chapter 3 and chapter 4, and we see Peter and John, Peter and John, Peter and John. But when it comes to the preaching, Peter's often doing the speaking. And so uh, that's a reminder for us today, I believe, we don't necessarily have to be out in front of people, being the one speaking, being the first one to talk. Maybe my job is to serve. And I think of the time uh, we had some great um, times of study in the word and um, evangelism with Diego. And Diego just had that personality to go to Broadway and Long Branch just to start conversations with people. And, and I, that doesn't come to me naturally. But I loved being there with him and being a part of those conversations and praying for him as he's having those conversations. So don't be afraid to be a support. But it's important for us to have partners in the gospel. I think of when Jesus sent out disciples in pairs, Mark 6, 7, and Luke 10, 1. His followers were sent out two by two. Unlike, it's, it's a very stark contrast to the apostles, uh, sorry, not the apostles, the prophets. We look at the Old Testament, and many of the prophets, they were, they were lone rangers, if I could say it like that. They lived alone. They served alone. It seemed like the world was against them. The nation was against them. But we see in the New Testament this model or this example of Jesus sending out the disciples in pairs. We also look at Paul. And yes, he had times where he was alone, but he many times had traveling partners on his missionary journeys. And in his letters, we see, oh, you know, he's mentioning people, uh, please come my way, come, come bring things to me. He mentions people by name of who've been partners with him in the gospel. And so it's very important that we live this Christian life uh, in community with partners in the gospel. So the question we have for us is, do we buddy up? Ecclesiastes 4, 9, and 10, again, a passage that we're familiar with, says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. 
but woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. So again, just like when Lisa and I were on that hike in the church, we need that. We need to lift our brothers and sisters up in Christ, especially when we think of spreading the gospel, sharing the gospel. We need to encourage one another. We cannot forget the importance of serving together in the local church. As we move on, we want to ask the question, why the temple? Why did the lame man know to go? Or why did he desire to be at the temple? Or at least his friends brought him to the temple. Why the temple? Why didn't they bring him somewhere else? Well, for one, there's a lot of people. There's a lot of foot traffic, right? Um, but another thing, the second thing, probably more important, is the people going into the temple, at least the devout Jews are very religious people, people who desire to speak with God or pray to God. They were known to be generous people, or at least they should have been, or they were expected to be generous people. So you say, okay, this is a good place. A lot of people, people should be generous. And sometimes it's people that were generally, sorry, genuinely generous. And others, and we could see this today, and maybe even in our own tendencies, we feel like, I'm about to pray to God. I got to make things right with him. Maybe let me do my good deed. Let me give to this beggar before I go in to pray. And so who knows? It could have been either of those. But then we turn that onto us, and we do a little bit of introspection. What about the church? Um, when people come to Belmar, if there's people here looking for money, do they go to the beach? Do they walk into the police station asking for money? No, in our own experience here, we've had people come into our church through our doors looking for money. And so that's something that sometimes makes us uncomfortable, but we have to understand, well, why is that? Well, people still have this idea of people going to church. They're devout. They're committed to God. They should be a generous people. So throughout scripture, the church is called to be generous. And that's the challenge for us. Are we generous? We're told that the church is to be generous, to be giving. Uh, we're not to have a reputation of pinching, pinching pennies or taking money. Uh, there's, I know I see sometimes right here on the radio, there's giving week or generosity week. But a lot of times when we hear that, whoever's declaring it giving week is usually asking people to give to them. We don't want to, we don't want to maintain, we don't want to uh, gain a reputation for that. Some churches do. Some preachers have this reputation of, well, they're eventually, at some point, they're going to pass that offering basket around. Or at some point, they're going to ask for money. We don't want that reputation. We look in Scripture, and we mentioned it last week, 2 Corinthians 8, 1 to 5. The Macedonians, Paul commended for being a giving, a generous people. They gave not just according to their means, but they gave beyond their means. They gave to the point where it was uncomfortable. You go to the next chapter in 2 Corinthians 9, and Paul encourages the Corinthians to sow bountifully. He tells them to be cheerful givers. He says to be generous in every way. And he wasn't just saying that, oh, because he needed money. Oftentimes we see Paul, he's not asking money for himself. He, he did say at times, well, he has the right to ask for money, but he would often ask for money to give to others in need, the churches in Jerusalem in particular. But he would, he would try to, to, to encourage people's generosity to give to others, to further the gospel, not to make his life more comfortable, as we see today in our own society. So what does generous mean? Or how, should, how generous should we be? I think when we define generosity, uh, one definition could be to give more than what is needed or to give abundantly. That should be characteristic of the church. That should be characteristic of us individually, but also us as a church. And also, like we mentioned for the Macedonians, we should give, we should be willing to give to the point of discomfort. We should be willing to give to the point of discomfort. My biggest fear, like I said, it can be uncomfortable when someone walks through these doors and they're asking for money and we want to be generous, but we also want to be wise stewards. So we don't want to throw that out the window. Um, but my biggest fear is that we gain a reputation um, for not just not being generous, but we gain a reputation for being a group of people who's asking for people's money. The church should not be known for that. Our church should not be known for that. I really like this quote. You've probably heard it before from John Wesley. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. I think that's a good reminder for us individually and as a church. So we continue on through our passage, and we look at these gestures of compassion that Peter and John um, showed. Peter and John looked at the man, and I'm reminded of Mark 10, 21, 
where Jesus, it says Jesus looked at the rich young ruler and he loved him. And so what's the power of eye contact? I have a little example for you. Many of you might not enjoy this. I don't know if Joe is here. Is Joe still here? No, he walked out. Craig, do you know who that is? Probably not. He's a musician. Joe and I were at a concert in Germany. Um, he's the, he was the lead singer of Sanctus Real, Matt Hammett. And so this at a concert. Um, Joe and I were at the front row on the stage, and I'm holding my camera up. And he actually comes up and, and grabs my hand and sings into the camera. So I was, like, real excited about that. Oh, that's so cool. So I wasn't going to play the video because you can hear me singing in the background, and it's not good. But I, I took a screenshot of it. I said, that was an exciting point for me. I don't have a relationship with this guy, but he made eye contact with me. Oh, it's, you think of these fans that are fainting. I didn't faint, I promise. But they're all excited when, you know, they're, they're lead singer or, or you know, they, they acknowledge you. Um, but a little later in the night, Craig, I bet you know who this is. Maybe not. Supertones. The, the, yeah, the lead singer for Supertones, Matt Morginsky. Jeff Risden was actually the manager for this band for a little while. Um, and I went up to, to this singer who was sitting in the back later in the evening, and I went up just to start a conversation with him. He, he returned some answers very short, but never made eye contact. And to be honest with you, I liked Supertones a little bit more than Sanctus Real at the time, but just from that evening, from simple eye contact that I had with the one lead singer, and, and I don't know if it's just a recognition of someone's existence. No, he doesn't love me. But the fact that Matt Morginsky didn't make eye contact with me, it kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Maybe he was having a bad night. I'm not trying to put him down. But the reason I'm sharing that is the power of eye contact. And we know that in our own lives, right? And we're going to talk a little bit more about how we respond to beggars when, when, when we see a homeless person in the street. But there is great power in eye contact. What else is there power in? There's power in touch. Verse 7 tells us that Peter, I think it says Peter just touched him. But I said Peter and John. I imagine John may have been helping as well. But they touched him in verse 7. Um, sorry, I don't lose my place here. They touched him. So the power of touch, Matthew, 8 chapter, Matthew chapter 8, verse 3, we see how Jesus touched and healed the leper. And I think of that story, I'm like, how many years was it since that leper was touched by anybody? And here we know this layman, his friends carried him, so I imagine he had some personal contact with his friends. But how long had it been since a stranger reached out and touched this man in love? How long had it been since someone had made eye contact? Even if someone gave money to him, a lot of times I know if I'm giving something to a homeless person, I might not even make eye contact. So why do we do that? That's the next question. How do we interact with beggars? How do we interact with people we see on the street who are asking for something, asking for money? I know a lot of times we don't make eye contact, and sometimes I would say that could be maybe because of guilt or maybe because when I look into someone's eyes, I'm forced to see their humanity. I'm forced to see, hey, this could be me. This is someone that's also made in the image of God. That eye contact has a, a really powerful way of speaking to us to say, okay, let me see this person with compassion. Let me see this person as another human being who's in need. But then also touch. In the world of COVID, that's something we, we I, I'm a very, I'm Italian and I love, I just grew up hugs and kisses and and I really missed the touch. We were kind of limiting that. And we've gotten used to that. Yeah, it's been about two years. But the power of touch in nursing school, we talked about that. We think of people, patients in hospitals who don't have great interaction or even during COVID, people were isolated. They couldn't even be with their family and feel the touch of their family member's hand. That's painful. That, that, that's a really difficult thing to do. The power of human touch, it, it, it conveys love. It conveys an acknowledgement that, that you're there. I see you. I see you're hurt and I'm here with you, I'm here by your side. So for whatever reasons, we, there might be multiple, we don't make eye contact with homeless people, with people that are in need, with beggars. Uh, we Very often, I, I can't tell you the last time I touched a homeless person. I think, you know, it would be like a hand on their shoulder and pray with them, but, but that's about as far as it goes. But Peter and John really stepped up and, and made eye contact. They said, look at me, look at us. And so the question for us today, individually and as a church, is are we willing to show that type of compassion? Sometimes it may be the first step in, in opening up a conversation about Jesus. And another thing we, we must remember, and you see it here in this picture, there's people who will see that. I think of my own kids, they'll see, well, how do you treat this person that's in need? How, how do you treat someone who's made in the image of God, who's just, who knows what their situation, what their story is? There's other people watching, not just our kids, but strangers, and say, okay, it's possible to love someone like that. And we can show the love of Christ just by a simple gesture. 
by looking at someone, by providing for them, by giving to them. And so I want to talk about this idea of greater need as we continue on with this story. There's a greater need that the beggar has. The lame beggar was asking for money to meet his needs. So we acknowledge that there's a, a very real need there. Whether it was for food, maybe it was to help out his friends who were carrying him, whatever the, uh, the need was, money does meet certain needs. Uh, but I, I read a book that was actually a really good book called Upstream by Dan Heath. I don't know if anybody's read that before, but it's it, not a Christian book, but it talks about addressing problems before they become a problem moving further upstream to address a problem so that we're not constantly battling every day this issue that keeps coming up. But if I do a little bit more work, if I spend a little more time, it can maybe address the problem further upstream so I'm not having to deal with it every day. To, to, to meet a deeper need, a greater need further upstream. Well, the lame beggar definitely had a deeper need. He did not recognize his greatest need. And again, we don't blame him. He had a need for money, for food, or for whatever it was but we don't blame them. I'm reminded of a time Lisa and I were in San Francisco outside the GR Deli factory and there was a beggar and he said, you know, can I have some money? And I told him, I don't have any money. He said, that's all right, I take credit card. He said, I don't give it back, but I take credit cards. I said, hold on, I, I, I give him credit. He, he had a sense of humor, um, but even that credit card, that could have gotten him maybe another meal, maybe a really nice meal. Could have gotten him a few things before I canceled it. It wasn't gonna meet his greatest need, the greatest need that we all have as sinners, the greatest need that we all have as sinners, and that's for forgiveness in Jesus Christ. So many times, and we have, I, I think it's in our own human um, fallenness, our own human brokenness, we seek to meet the immediate need more than meeting the greater need. And there's a quote I really enjoy by this guy, Emmanuel Acha. You may have seen him on TV. He's on different programs, but um, he had this quote that I heard just last week or the week before. He said, too many people are giving up what they want more for what they want now. And that's something that really hit me. Too many people are giving up what they want more for what they want now. And I would even say for the lame beggar or for, for people who have not um, been forgiven by Christ, who, people who have not accepted Christ, they're giving up what they feel they need more for what they, sorry, they're giving up what they need more, and that's forgiveness in Jesus Christ, for what they feel that they need right now. And, and that's, that, that's the story of humanity, right? Peter says, I don't have silver and gold, but what I have, I give to you. I remember Doc Locke was sharing his testimony at Men and Boys Prayer Breakfast. This might have been three or four years ago, but it's always stuck with me. And he said, um, you can't sell it if you don't own it. And not that we treat the gospel like a sales pitch, but, but the point he was getting across was, unless we truly believe the gospel, unless we truly believe that Jesus Christ is the answer, the truth, the provision for man's greatest need, then it's going to be impossible for us to convey that to someone else. We need to truly believe it. We need to own it. This idea that Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth that he is the only way to forgiveness of sins through his death, through his sacrifice on the cross. So really, the challenge for us today individually and as a church, we must help people recognize their greatest need, but it doesn't end there. We don't stop there and say, okay, well, you need Jesus. You need forgiveness of sins. There's a greater need that you have. It's our job to point them to Jesus Christ. Just like Craig shared this morning, uh, Jesus said, you know, I will be lifted up and draw all men to myself. It's our responsibility as ambassadors for Christ to point people to Jesus, not just to say you have a need, but to say there's someone who can meet that need. What an exciting thing that that's a reality, that, that we have that truth. And so continuing this thought of, of God um, meeting a greater need, I think in the Christian life, um, we can recognize that too. I found this picture and here's someone filling up a car that probably doesn't run. And so this car has a lot of deeper needs than just filling up the gas tank, but clearly the person's ignoring that. They're just, you know, putting gas in the tank. So I thought of some examples. Lisa and I were just trying to go through, and I'm sure there's more in scripture we can find. We go back to Acts chapter one, six and eight. The disciples asked Jesus before he ascended, is this the time now that you're gonna restore the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus said, that's not for you to know. Your job is to wait for the Holy Spirit and to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. God had a greater plan of salvation, of restoration for the entire world. It wasn't just for the nation of Israel. There was a greater need, and God, and God through Jesus, 
plan to meet it, through the disciples' plan to meet it. We see that through the book of Acts. John 16, 7, the disciples were really concerned Jesus was leaving them. Hold on, we need you. We need to be with you. You can't leave us. But Jesus said, it's to your advantage. It's to your benefit that I go away. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's coming. And again, we read about that. And the Holy Spirit will indwell each and every one of you. Rather than having one person that everyone has to try to get, you know, a few minutes with, we have the Holy Spirit. And that's true for us today. God has a greater plan. He meets a greater need. And I think the best picture of this uh, is in Luke 15, 19. We see the prodigal son. He has this plan to ask his father to make him like one of the hired servants. And the father runs to the son when he sees him and doesn't even give him a chance to ask that. And says, no, you are welcomed back into the family. You are my son. You were dead. You're alive. You were lost. Now you're found. And he throws a party for him. And God has a desire to meet that greater need, to do above and beyond what we ask or think. Ephesians 3.20 tells us, reminds us the truth that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Now, the ultimate picture of this is in the gospel, right? Through Jesus Christ, through his sacrifice, through his shed blood, we can have forgiveness of sins. But it's not just a, a, a get out of jail free, get out of hell free card. It's not just we're saved from eternal punishment. We're also adopted into his family. We have a great inheritance waiting for us. We can enjoy eternal life right now. God has met that greater need and provided above and beyond that greater need. And we can be thankful for that as a church. And that should help us. Uh, that should help us um, just continue our, our lives, our walk with Christ. We need to be thankful for what God has pride, provided in the person of Jesus Christ. And that should spur us on to going out with the gospel, to sharing the good news with others. I try to stick with the alliteration for gross healing. I don't mean gross like disgusting healing, gross as in complete healing. This was a complete healing. And it made me think of at least contrasting this healing, comparing this healing with the healings that have been popular on TV for the last few decades. Um, there's this documentary called American Gospel. Maybe some of you have seen it. We uh, watched it with some of um, the guys we do Bible study with. And um, it talks about the prosperity gospel, but also how many of them are these faith healers. And, and they reveal some of the scams and some of the things that happen behind the scenes. But some of the things that are much different from what we see on TV is this healing was immediate. Peter and John said, rise up and walk. Peter said, rise up and walk. And right away it happened. On TV, some of these programs, you see a, a temporary alleviation of maybe a vague illness, maybe lower back pain, which is serious. I'm not trying to lie. Or a chronic headache, something that you can't really prove or show. This man was lame. For, it says later, it says for at least 40 years. You don't fake not being able to walk for 40 years. This was a legitimate problem that he had, and it was healed immediately in the name of Jesus. Another thing we reminded, the healing was complete. Peter says in his message in Acts chapter 3, later on in this chapter, uh, that he was strong and he was in perfect health, is the words at least that are translated in the ESV. And it was more than just walking. What did we sing, right? We did our, our power skips. He was walking and leaping and praising God. It was complete healing. He didn't have to be helped off a stage or carried anywhere or a little help from his friends. He was walking and leaping. Complete. It says his... his uh, his ankles and his feet were made strong immediately. And another contrast, another difference from what we would see today is there was no exchange of money. Peter said, silver and gold have I none. And a lot of times today we see these healings and say, well, you need to give money. If your faith is strong enough, you will give and God will bless you through it. That's not the message of the gospel. There was no exchange of money here. I remember um, traveling with, uh, with Dave Johnson uh, was it MacArthur Highway going north of Manila? And we were at a rest area and we're walking out. And um, the, the person behind at the cash register, cash register said, oh, are you a salesman? They just didn't know what we see. What, why, why are you here? And you know Tagalog. That's very interesting to me. And he said, are you a salesman? And, and Dave explained to me. He was saying it in Tagalog, but he explained to me after the conversation. And he basically told him, yes, I am a salesman, but I don't make any money. What I'm selling is free. And it's the most wonderful news in the world. And so I just like how we kind of turned the conversation towards the gospel, but he was making a point. The gospel is not for us to make money off of as individuals or the church. The gospel is free and it's life-changing. It's life-transforming. And we see this with the lame man. 
It transformed his life. Isaiah 35, 5 to 6. For the sake of time, we won't turn there, but I'll read it to you. Isaiah 35, 5 to 6 says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. So this was not the final fulfillment of this prophecy from Isaiah, but it was a glimpse of it. It was a glimpse of a future fulfillment. And our brother Greg, what was that, four weeks ago, five weeks ago, spoke of that, that there's a near fulfillment, but then there's a further fulfillment. And we can see this here, this lame man leaping. It's the same language that's used. This is a glimpse of that one day, that future fulfillment, where all will be taken care of. Everything will be made right. This was a, a small glimpse of that. So the question for us today, the challenge for us, do we as the church believe that God can heal today? Well, spiritually, I think we would all agree, yes, God can heal. He's shown us he can heal completely. In Christ, there is immediate and complete forgiveness of sins. But as followers of Christ, I believe we also need to be okay with God doing miracles and God providing physical healing. We pray for that, right? We need to be okay with that. But we still need to remember that God's ultimate desire is for spiritual healing. If we go around doing good in the world, I think of Jersey Shore Rescue Mission. They're meeting so many physical needs. What a wonderful ministry they have. But that's so in order that they have a platform so that they can share the gospel and save people's souls, not just their lives, their physical lives, but save people's souls. That's our responsibility as the church. That's our responsibility as followers of Christ. And so we look through verses 9 through 11 as we move further along in this story. And Peter and John garnered attention. They gained attention with this healing of the lame beggar. And so they didn't use it to say, okay, let's make some more money. Okay, let's, let's make a name for ourselves. <clears throat> you see in Peter's message that he said, no, it's not about us. It's not by any power we have. It's in the name of Jesus that this man was healed. And he goes on to preach a powerful gospel message. I think of Noah building the ark, right? He was just being faithful and obedient to God. We shouldn't try to gain attention in, in any ways that are wrong or any ways that, that are not good or pleasing to God. Simply by obeying God and being faithful, there will be attention drawn to us. And we look at Noah building the ark, and clearly there would have been attention that they see him building this big ark. So Peter and John began, Acts chapter 3 and 4, it all began by simply loving this beggar and healing the beggar through the, through the power of Christ. But they began by loving the beggar. The change in this beggar's life could not be missed. He was dead like the prodigal son. He was dead and is now alive. He was lost and is now found. Excuse me. <clears throat> and then Peter preached. So we see that it was the work, it was the miracle through the Holy Spirit that validated, that authenticated the, word of, the words of Peter, the gospel message. So he didn't just come into the temple and start preaching the gospel. He came, he was faithful to God, he served, he saw this man, they loved this man, and he was healed. And so it brought attention to them, but all said, okay, we better listen to this guy, right? Luke 5, 23, I'm reminded of when Jesus, uh, the, the religious leaders were questioning Jesus when he said, um, your sins are forgiven to the man who was let down from the roof. But then Jesus said, what is, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But so the crowd may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said, get up and walk. So he proved that he had the authority to, to forgive sins. So in a similar way, Peter's actions, Peter and John's, that the miracle that was performed through them authenticated the word that Peter was about to speak. So the question for us, church, and individually, do our lives outside of this building, when we leave the church doors, when it's not Sunday morning, are people interested in what we have to say because of the way we live our lives, because of the way we speak, because of the way we love others, because of the way we love our enemies? When we walk outside these doors, our lives should garner attention in a good way and should really build the platform to give us an audience that people will listen when we speak. We don't want to be hypocrites. A lot of times we know Christians, we're accused of being hypocrites. We want our words to line up with our lives. I'm reminded of Philippians 1.27, very simple verse. Different versions say, let your conduct, your conversation, let your manner of life 
be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And that's a real challenge for us. And I think each of us spending time with Christ, spending time in the, wor in the word, praying, God, make me more like Christ. Our lives need to line up with the words that we are speaking. Otherwise, people won't listen. They won't give us the time of day. So I know my responsibility when I was given the, these three weeks was to uh, look at the messages of Peter. We, we've, we touched on the first one. We definitely spent more time with that. Um, we're not going to have time to look later on in Acts chapter 3 um, at Peter's message. But again, this was done in Solomon's porch, Solomon's portico. We're told that after this message, there were, depending on your translation, there were 5,000 souls saved, but I believe many translations said that the number of men who believed came up to 5,000. So I'm not sure if that includes the 3,000 from the day of Pentecost or if that's additional 5,000, but regardless, it's a lot of people. There was power in the miracle, but there was power in Peter's words because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then we look, Acts 4, 8 through 12, is after the arrest, the next day, Peter and John stand before the council. And actually, we'll look at that at the next slide, a little bit about that scenario. But, um, but these sermons, at least, that, sec that first and second sermon, and even the third sermon, they go through five points here that we mentioned. Peter addresses the listeners. He acknowledges their concerns. He's not afraid to let the truth of God offend. And this is a slide from our first week. Um, but he's not afraid to let the truth of God offend. And I know that's something I've talked about before. We don't want to be offensive in the way we go about our lives and the way that we go about sharing the gospel with people. But if the word of God offends people, we need to be okay with that. If we lose friends because of the truth of the gospel, we need to be okay with that as followers of Christ. Are we seeking to please man or are we seeking to please God? Peter says that. Um, he also, in his messages, he leans on the authority of scripture, quoting from scripture, referring to scripture. And then he anticipates a response. And again, we see the response in Acts chapter four where they're arrested, they're standing before the council, they're told never to speak in Jesus's name again. And we see, again, a trend in Peter's messages. I mentioned it maybe the first week. Um, my friends kind of summed it up like this. Peter's gospel message is you killed him, at least in these first few chapters. You killed him. God raised him. We saw him. Now what are you going to do about it? You killed him. God raised him. We saw him. Now what are you going to do about it? So that was Peter's message. He, he wasn't afraid to be direct. He wasn't afraid to offend because it was the truth. And so in summing up, Acts 3 through 4, we see the effects, the domino effect of Peter and John healing the lame beggar. It gave them an opportunity uh, to, to share the gospel. Their ministering and their healing to one man validated their preaching and authenticated their word. It brought attention to the gospel. And again, we mentioned the number of men came to about 5,000, the number of men who believed we see in Acts 4, 4. But then we also see, and this is something we're going to get as we go through the book of Acts, persecution and opposition bring attention to the gospel. And we see that here in Acts 3 to 4. It's really our first picture of, of um, real persecution against the church. I mean, the church was just formed. And right away, we're seeing in the very next chapter, there's persecution. And that's true for us today. We need to expect that. Jesus himself said, the world hated me. It's going to hate you. We need to expect that. And I think it helps for us. If we're expecting it, we're a little more prepared for it. And so we're not surprised by it. We say, okay, we just keep being faithful. What God has called us to do, we can be obedient. We can love others. We can still share the gospel, even if there's opposition. And let's be honest, in this country, I don't even know if we can call it persecution. We face opposition. There's some people throughout the world that are really facing imprisonment, that are really facing death because of their faith in Jesus Christ, even for speaking the name of Jesus. We don't face that today. Maybe one day we do, but it doesn't change the fact that we all need to be faithful to what God has called us to do, to live Christ-like lives to preach the gospel in and out of season, to be ready to give a defense, a reason for the hope that is in us. And so I think to sum this up, actually, before we go through this slide, just as a reminder to kind of to go through our points here, it's important for us as individuals and as a church to have partnerships in the gospel. We need to rely on one another, encourage one another, pray with one another. Last Sunday night, I really enjoyed the conversation we had here. And a lot of the conversation went to the importance of prayer. And maybe how can we do things differently here at Fifth Avenue? How can we really lean on the power of prayer and the importance of prayer? We need gospel partners. Also, we need to be generous givers. Again, individually, but as a church. 
and not as a church saying, okay, be generous givers, let's go, you know, give your money to the church. No, we as a church need to be giving outward. We need to be giving to those in need. We need to be putting our funds to spread the gospel, to love others, to meet physical needs so that we might be able to meet their spiritual needs. We need to be generous givers. And also we need to help people recognize their greatest need. And also, not just there, but recognize and point them to the one who can meet that greatest need. That's the responsibility of us individually as ambassadors of Christ, but also as a church. We need to be uh, equipping one another to go out and to preach the gospel, to help people meet that greater need in Jesus Christ. And we saw gross healing or complete healing, and that's only in the person of Jesus Christ, at least when it comes to our sins. This world will try to address it through works, through giving to a church, through membership to a church, various ways, through their own version of spirituality. The word of God tells us there's only complete healing in Jesus Christ. There's only complete forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. And then we need to remember to garner attention with our lives. Do our lives line up with the words that we say? Are we being faithful? Are we being obedient? In and of itself, in this dark world, if we're being lights, that's going to draw attention right away. People will notice, hey, you talk a little different. People will notice, hey, you did that small act of kindness. Or, hey, you have a peace about you in the midst of all this calamity. They're going to notice a difference, and they're going to, going to want to know why. We need to be prepared. Once we have that attention, we need to be prepared to share the good news with them. Well, why do we have that peace? Why do I talk a little bit different? Why am I going to show kindness to someone who's my enemy? Things like that. Sometimes the smallest things people catch, people are watching. And we need to remember that. So that's kind of a summary of what we covered, but I think there, there's two things I really want us to walk away with. When we look at God's word, a lot of times we see ourselves, we put ourselves in, in the shoes of the hero, right? The, the person who's really doing great things. So I think of David and Goliath. And yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with seeing ourselves as David and saying, okay, we need to trust that the Lord will provide and we need to stand up, um, you know, to... Um, to, to represent God in certain situations. But we also don't want to forget that David represents Christ in many ways. But so many times our tendency is to put ourselves in the shoes of the hero, and that's okay. But I say, first, let's put ourselves in the shoes of the beggar, this layman. Can we see ourselves in the beggar? And so we look at Acts chapter 4. Actually, I'm just going to turn, if you just look ahead, Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 is a verse that's familiar to us. That's where Peter, he's standing before the council and he's speaking to them. He's standing up boldly, we're told. And he says, and there is salvation in no one else for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved, by which we must be saved. So very clear message right there. Very clear gospel. And then the verses that follow that, we talk about the beggar and the council. It says, but seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. I love this picture. I think when we go through the story, we forget the lame man who was now walking was standing with them when they were kind of on trial. It's like they would say, okay, exhibit A. Look at this man who was lame for 40 years, and now he's standing. Just the fact of him standing here is proof that there's power in the name of Jesus. Well, by our lives, we were once lost. We were once dead in our sin. Through our lives, we can show people that there is power in the name of Jesus. And people can look at a changed life, and they have nothing to say in opposition. And so may that be true of us. If we are in Christ, that people can look at our lives and say, there's nothing we can say. There is power in the name of Jesus. And then we look at Peter and John, the heroes of the story, if you will. Acts 4.13, we're told, now when they saw the council, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. I've been accused of being an uneducated, common man before. That's fine. I have no problem with that. But it says they saw the boldness of Peter and John. So they were common men, common men. By the world standards, they were uneducated men, but they had boldness and they perceived that they had been with Jesus. When the world looks at us, may they perceive, may they see there's something different about us and not just, oh, because they're different, but oh, because they're with Jesus. They spend time with Jesus. They've been forgiven by Jesus. May, the, may that be true of us. May the world see that in us. So as we continue through this book of Acts, it's my prayer, it's our desire uh, that we, as those who have been saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ, will live and love faithfully as the church has been called to live, 
as the church has been called to live in love. May we follow through with that, what the early church did. They were faithful in many ways. Also, it's our desire that we understand more deeply through this journey through the book of Acts, what the gospel is, what the gospel is not, and, um, and what the church should look like. And we can be a part of that. Let's just close our, our time in prayer. God, our Father, we thank you for this book of Acts. We thank you for <clears throat> the miraculous ways in which you worked in the early church. Um, we see the day of Pentecost. We see the giving of your Holy Spirit. And um, we recognize that, that many of these men had seen the risen Christ. And Father, we know through their testimony, we know through the truth of your word that truly Christ is risen. We have a living Savior. And we also know through your word and through the power of changed lives that your spirit indwells everyone who comes to Christ, who recognizes their need for a Savior, who recognizes uh, the sin that exists in, in, this, in our lives that nothing in this world can take care of. We thank you that Christ came and died on the cross for no sin of his own, but for our sins. And we thank you for that free gift of salvation. And Father, as we see this story of Peter and John, we thank you for their faithfulness and not worried about maybe even being late for a prayer meeting, but stopping to, to look at this beggar, uh, to, to, to touch him and to heal him in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the power of the name of Jesus. We pray that we might not forget that as we go about our lives. We pray that as we leave this place, that our lives would reflect those who have been with Jesus, those who have been completely changed, those who have been forgiven, um, completely healed because of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you again for this book. May we continue to learn from it and take lessons that you would have for us uh, as, as we make this journey through the book of Acts. We thank you for this record that's been provided to us. And may we not take it just as a story for us to gain knowledge and to know it, but for our lives to be changed by it. May your Holy Spirit do a work in each of our lives as we continue through this book. We love you and we thank you and we ask these things in Jesus' name.